Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I get the sense that you all know who you're here to see. But before I introduce our very special guest speaker, I want to introduce over there Debbie Higgins, who is here from Cornerstone Caregiving. Um, home care, you may recognize her. She has done some sponsorships in the past, but she very kindly um, provided all the refreshments today. So thank you, Debbie. I'm now going to introduce uh, Ted Reinstein. Briefly introduce. I'll be brief, brief, brief. All right, yeah. I know he's really got done a whole lot more than just Chronicle, but. Um, As I always say, Debbie, why put the audience to sleep before I All right, all right. Then I won't. Then I won't. Okay, all right. So I think you all know him um, from Chronicle. He has won awards and he's written books, and today he's going to talk about his novel, Before Brooklyn. Short and sweet. Thank you, Ted. Not everybody can do that. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you very much. That's the kind of intro I like. Quick. Quick. How are you? Good to see you. What a great turnout. I love it. I love it. Thank you all for coming out. Um, so, as Debbie mentioned, I'm going to talk to you uh, this afternoon about my uh, most recent book. And um, how many of you like baseball? How many of you are just so-so about baseball? You'll still like this. You know why? How many, of you, how many of you like history? How many of you like the story of an underdog coming back and beating someone much bigger and stronger? Yeah. That's what this is. How many now, Brooklyn? how many from Brooklyn? Where in Brooklyn are you from? No kidding. I lived for several years in the Heights. How about that? Just like Patty Duke. Remember her? I'm aging myself. But in this room, that's OK. But the story is not just about baseball. That's my point. It is really about American history. It is about one of America's most iconic legendary heroes, right, Jackie Robinson, who is a lifelong hero of mine. Um, and it is about underdogs. And I, I think we all love the story of an underdog, whether it's somebody beating City Hall or somebody beating baseball, right? It's the still the story of somebody who's motivated by doing something right that may still be really, really difficult to engage victorious in, and you try anyway. In this case, they did it. They did it. And the amazing thing is the they in this case is not Jackie Robinson. He comes at the end. It's all the people who came before him who are unknown, who are still unknown. Some of you will hear their names for the very first time. And they, I didn't know that. In fact, I'm going to start with a little riddle, OK? Because part of why I wanted to write this book is that I've often been fascinated. A lot of people, everybody, almost everybody said they like history. I've always been fascinated by the fact that very often we think we understand what happened in some certain historical event or era or achievement, right? And then we get older, maybe we read something, someone tells us something, we're like, I didn't know that. And it adds this whole context to something we thought we understood, right? This is a perfect case in point. And I'm gonna prove to you right now just how dramatically we sometimes think we know something, and in fact, we have more to learn. All of us. It started with me in writing this book, right? So here's a question to start off. After Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, anybody have a guess as to who became the second black major league ball player? Yes, sir. Larry Doby. Very good guess. Very good guess. Say again. Willie Mays. Willie Mays. Another good guess. Two guys right around that same period. Yep. Willie Mays, Larry Doby, anybody else? Anybody else? Two good guesses, right? Yes, sir. Pumpsy Green, a little bit later, off by about a decade, but that's, no. But those are all good guesses, right in the ballpark, as it were, all wrong. Um, because, no, because it's a trick question. What I just asked you is a trick question, but it perfectly proves my point. Because after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, the second black major league ball player was Jackie Robinson, right? Was Jackie Robinson. Because, and here's the thing that sounds like blasphemy when I say it, but you'll understand what I'm talking about when I explain it. Jackie Robinson did not do the thing you think he did. Jackie Robinson did not 
into great Major League Baseball. Jackie Robinson reintegrated Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball had been integrated more than 60 years before Jackie Robinson in 1947, and it was integrated by someone you've probably never heard of, Moses Fleetwood Walker. That's my point. So look what you've just learned about a seminal event in American history, right? That you've been thinking it wrong. We all do. We all do. You stop 90, 999 out of 1,000 people tomorrow, today, and ask them, what did Jackie Robinson do? They will tell you that he integrated Major League Baseball. He did not. It takes nothing away from Jackie Robinson. Are you kidding? His achievement was historic. It was the first actual civil rights victory of the 20th century. So there's nothing taken away from Jackie Robinson. However, what, that, what not fully grasping that history and the people who created it, what it also does is it denies, it denies appreciation for all these people who came right before Jackie Robinson who paved the trail. That's what we're going to talk about. So if Moses Fleetwood Walker integrated Major League Baseball 60-plus years before Jackie Robinson, what does it also tell us about Major League Baseball? It was an outlier. Believe it or not, even though I have plenty of negative things to say about Major League Baseball, not to mention our Red Sox, um, <laughs> don't tempt me. But, but the point is, Major League Baseball was unique as a large, very big American institution, even in its early years, even in the 19th century, right? It was actually, unlike any other comparable American institution, it was integrated, not by a lot. There was never more than one or two, in one case in Newark, New Jersey, three black players on one professional white team. However, uh, how many Supreme Court, black Supreme Court justices do you think there were in the 1880s? Huh? Not too many, right? So they were actually integrated. Major League Baseball looked a little bit more like, uh, what is that on my screen? Is there a teenager in the house? <laughs> Let me see if I can get, get rid of that. Good luck. Yeah, for now. Um, so Major League Baseball actually looked a little bit more like America when it began. Major League Baseball begins, it has its infancy. Look, there were people playing baseball, what they called baseball, rounders and so forth in the 1840s. The Knickerbockers in New York were playing in Manhattan in the 1840s and 50s. Major League Baseball gets its start in the 1870s and 80s. By the 1890s, there were fully two major league leagues, right? So this is the period right after the Civil War, and that's going to be important, right? So it's right after the Civil War, and you have players like Bud Fowler, one of the most impassioned, exciting, early black pioneering ball players. You have, I like pointing out Frank Grant because he was the first black professional ball player from Massachusetts from the Berkshires in the 1870s, and most famous of all, the Walker brothers. Moses Fleetwood Walker right here, his younger brother Weldy right here. In 1881, they were briefly teammates on the Oberlin Ohio College baseball team, and Moses Fleetwood Walker was a truly transformational figure. And I don't mean just in baseball. He was transformational in terms of culturally, in terms of our society, for baseball, he was totally transformational, and by that I mean literally transformational. He transformed an entire position in the sport of baseball, catcher. He was a catcher. So prior to Moses Fleetwood Walker, right? Without Moses Fleetwood Walker, there would have been no Johnny Bench, no Mickey Cochran, no Jason Varitek, right? Pudge Rodriguez, the greatest catchers of all time. He was the first one. And before him, believe it or not, the role of catcher on a baseball team Let's put it this way. It was where you stuck the single worst player on the team. If it was the judgment of everybody involved with that team that Eddie sucks, he's the catcher. Why? Because they didn't have to do anything. This is when the term backstop is coined for the catcher. Today, we think of a backstop. What do you think of? You think of a physical structure, right? With netting or whatever to keep a batted ball from hitting the crowd. Not then. There were no physical structures. Baseball, in the wake of the Civil War, especially in the South, was often played in fields that had been cleared from rubble. There was no backstop. Who cares if somebody gets hit in the kisser with a baseball? 
first of all, the baseballs didn't go as far and they didn't go as fast and they weren't as hard. So a lot less injuries. However, backstop was what defined the catcher because that's what you were. You were the back. Eddie was the backstop. All you got to do is keep the ball from rolling off the field and interrupting the flow of the game. You got one job. You don't have to hit. You don't have to run because we know you can't anyway. He changed all of that overnight. This was an exceptional, extraordinary athlete. For a catcher, people couldn't even catch up to him. He was so fast. He was what we would call in baseball today a five-tool player. He could play all five facets of the game and play it with excellence. He could hit. He could hit with power. He could run. He could throw. He could field his position. He was extraordinary. So extraordinary, and this is the, the, the best test of all, he was signed by a white major league baseball team who knew perfectly well that there would be blowback and there was but that's how good he was they're looking at this guy and they're like somebody's going to sign this guy and we're going to do it so the toledo blue stockings who were a major league team at that time in toledo ohio they signed moses fleetwood walker to be their starting catcher for the 1884 season so he transformed also culturally politically because of that this is a young black man who was born at the time slavery still existed, whose parents had been born into slavery, and is now, is now the very first black player to be signed and opening to play on a major league team in the 1884 season. This is like the feel-good story of the year, right? Newspapers were flocking to see this guy play and to report this story. There's always someone who sees a feel-good story and feels bad about it, though, right? There's always someone. And in this case, it happened to be someone with an oversized influence on Major League Baseball because the very first black Major League ball player was being met on the other side of the field for this very first game in 1884 by none other than the first bona fide superstar of Major League Baseball. He was the superstar slugging captain first baseman of the Chicago Cubs, who were themselves the marquee team of early baseball. It was only later that they had decades and decades of futility. <laughs> early on, early on, they were amazing. People would travel all night on trains just to see the Cubs play and to see their dashing young captain with his handlebar mustache hit a home run. And incredibly, and to give the man his due, because in a moment I'll take it away, but to give the man his due, Cap Anson, who's in the Hall of Fame, still holds two or three batting records for the Chicago Cubs. Now, you have to acknowledge that's extraordinary because this was the dead ball era, as they say. As I mentioned, the ball didn't go as far. He still was a monstrous home run hitter. So that's, part, that's definitely part of his record, no matter what. Also part of his record, and not on his plaque in Cooperstown, he was known as an unrepentant racist. He was a bully. And apparently, he had an uncommonly foul mouth, which has always fascinated me. Because, listen, I grew up uh, with brothers. I played sports. I know my way around a locker room. And yet, it was said that he had such a foul mouth that even his teammates were embarrassed. I would have loved to have heard what kind of mouth that was. <laughs> but, but at any rate, not on his plaque in Cooperstown, and Cap Anson did not like the idea that his Chicago Cubs, the vaunted Cubs, were opening up the season against... <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I get the sense that you all know who you're here to see. But before I introduce our very special guest speaker, I want to introduce over there Debbie Higgins, who is here from Cornerstone Caregiving. Um, home care, you may recognize her. She has done some sponsorships in the past, but she very kindly um, provided all the refreshments today. So thank you, Debbie. Um, now going to introduce uh, Ted Reinstein. Briefly introduce. I'll be brief, brief, brief. All right, yeah. I know he's really got, done a whole lot more than just Chronicle, but... Um, As I always say, Debbie, why put the audience to sleep before I even start? All right, all right, then I won't, then I won't. Okay, all right, so I think you all know him um, from Chronicle. He has won awards, and he's written books, and today he's going to talk about his novel, Before Brooklyn. 
short and sweet. Thank you, Ted. Not everybody can do that. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you very much. That's the kind of intro I like. Quick, quick. How are you? Good to see. What a great turnout. I love it. I love it. Thank you all for coming out. Um, so, as Debbie mentioned, I'm going to talk to you uh, this afternoon about my uh, most recent book. And um, how many of you like baseball? How many of you are just so-so about baseball? You'll still like this. You know why? How many, of you, how many of you like history? How many of you like the story of an underdog coming back and beating someone much bigger and stronger? Yeah. That's what this is. Now, how many from Brooklyn? Where in Brooklyn are you from? No kidding. I lived for several years in the Heights. How about that? Just like Patty Duke. Remember her? I'm aging myself. But in this room, that's okay. But the story is not just about baseball. That's my point. It is really about American history. It is about one of America's most iconic legendary heroes, right? Jackie Robinson, who is a lifelong hero of mine. Um, and it is about underdogs. And I, I think we all love the story of an underdog, whether it's somebody beating City Hall or somebody beating baseball, right? It's the still the story of somebody who's motivated by doing something right that may still be really, really difficult to engage victorious in, and you try anyway. In this case, they did it. They did it. And the amazing thing is, the they in this case is not Jackie Robinson. He comes at the end. It's all the people who came before him who were unknown, who are still unknown. Some of you will hear their names for the very first time. And they, I didn't know that. In fact, I'm going to start with a little riddle, OK? Because part of why I wanted to write this book is that I've often been fascinated. A lot of people, everybody, almost everybody said they like history. I've always been fascinated by the fact that very often we think we understand what happened in some certain historical event or era or achievement, right? And then we get older, maybe we read something, someone tells us something, we're like, I didn't know that. And it adds this whole context to something we thought we understood, right? This is a perfect case in point. And I'm gonna prove to you right now just how dramatically we sometimes think we know something, and in fact, we have more to learn. All of us. It started with me in writing this book, right? So here's a question to start off. After Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, anybody have a guess as to who became the second black major league ball player? Yes, sir. Larry Doby. Very good guess. Very good guess. Say again. Willie Mays. Willie Mays. Another good guess. Two guys right around that same period. Yep. Willie Mays, Larry Doby, anybody else? Anybody else? Two good guesses, right? Yes, sir. Pumpsy Green, a little bit later, off by about a decade, but that's, no. But those are all good guesses, right in the ballpark, as it were, all wrong. Um, because, no, because it's a trick question. What I just asked you is a trick question, but it perfectly proves my point. Because after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, the second black major league ball player was Jackie Robinson, right? Was Jackie Robinson. Because, and here's the thing that sounds like blasphemy when I say it, but you'll understand what I'm talking about when I explain it. Jackie Robinson did not do the thing you think he did. Jackie Robinson did not integrate Major League Baseball. Jackie Robinson reintegrated Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball had been integrated more than 60 years before Jackie Robinson in 1947, and it was integrated by someone you've probably never heard of, Moses Fleetwood Walker. That's my point. So look what you've just learned about a seminal event in American history, right? That you've been thinking it wrong. We all do. We all do. You stop 90, 999 out of 1,000 people tomorrow, today, and ask them, what did Jackie Robinson do? They will tell you that he integrated Major League Baseball. He did not. It takes nothing away from Jackie Robinson. Are you kidding? His achievement was historic, 
It was the first actual civil rights victory of the 20th century. So there's nothing taken away from Jackie Robinson. However, what, that, what not fully grasping that history and the people who created it, what it also does is it denies, it denies appreciation for all these people who came right before Jackie Robinson, who paved the trail. That's what we're going to talk about. So if Moses Fleetwood Walker integrated Major League Baseball 60-plus years before Jackie Robinson, what does it also tell us about Major League Baseball? It was an outlier. Believe it or not, even though I have plenty of negative things to say about Major League Baseball, not to mention our Red Sox, um, <laughs> don't tempt me. But, but the point is, Major League Baseball was unique as a large, very big American institution, even in its early years, even in the 19th century, right? It was actually, unlike any other comparable American institution, it was integrated, not by a lot. There was never more than one or two, in one case in Newark, New Jersey, three black players on one professional white team. However, uh, how many Supreme Court, black Supreme Court justices do you think there were in the 1880s? Huh? Not too many, right? So they were actually integrated. Major League Baseball looked a little bit more like, uh, what is that on my screen? Is there a teenager in the house? <laughs> Let me see if I can get, get rid of that. Good luck. Yeah, for now. Um, so Major League Baseball actually looked a little bit more like America when it began. Major League Baseball begins. It has its infancy. Look, there were people playing baseball, what they call baseball, rounders and so forth in the 1840s. The Knickerbockers in New York were playing in Manhattan in the 1840s and 50s. Major League Baseball gets its start in the 1870s and 80s. By the 1890s, there were fully two major league leagues, right? So this is the period right after the Civil War, and that's going to be important, right? So it's right after the Civil War, and you have players like Bud Fowler, one of the most impassioned, exciting, early black pioneering ball players. You have, I like pointing out Frank Grant because he was the first black professional ball player from Massachusetts from the Berkshires in the 1870s, and most famous of all, the Walker Brothers. Moses Fleetwood Walker right here, his younger brother Weldy right here. In 1881, they were briefly teammates on the Oberlin Ohio College baseball team, and Moses Fleetwood Walker was a truly transformational figure. And I don't mean just in baseball. He was transformational in terms of culturally, in terms of our society, for baseball, he was totally transformational, and by that I mean literally transformational. He transformed an entire position in the sport of baseball, catcher. He was a catcher. So prior to Moses Fleetwood Walker, right? Without Moses Fleetwood Walker, there would have been no Johnny Bench, no Mickey Cochran, no Jason Varitek, right? Pudge Rodriguez, the greatest catchers of all time. He was the first one. And before him, believe it or not, the role of catcher on a baseball team Let's put it this way. It was where you stuck the single worst player on the team. If it was the judgment of everybody involved with that team that Eddie sucks, he's the catcher. Why? Because they didn't have to do anything. This is when the term backstop is coined for the catcher. Today, we think of a backstop. What do you think of? You think of a physical structure, right? With netting or whatever to keep a batted ball from hitting the crowd. Not then. There were no physical structures. Baseball, in the wake of the Civil War, especially in the South, was often played in fields that had been cleared from rubble. There was no backstop. Who cares if somebody gets hit in the kisser with a baseball? <laughs> First of all, the baseballs didn't go as far, and they didn't go as fast, and they weren't as hard. So a lot less injuries. However, backstop was what defined the catcher, because that's what you were. You were the back. Eddie was the backstop. All you got to do is keep the ball from rolling off the field and interrupting the flow of the game. You got one job. You don't have to hit. You don't have to run because we know you can't anyway. <laughs> he changed all of that overnight. This was an exceptional, extraordinary athlete. For a catcher, people couldn't even catch up to him. He was so fast. He was what we would call in baseball today a five-tool player. He could play all five facets of the game and play it with excellence. He could hit, he could hit with power, he could run, he could throw, he could field his position. He was extraordinary. So extraordinary, and this is the, the, the best test of all, 
he was signed by a white major league baseball team who knew perfectly well that there would be blowback and there was but that's how good he was they're looking at this guy and they're like somebody's going to sign this guy and we're going to do it so the toledo blue stockings who were a major league team at that time in toledo ohio they signed moses fleetwood walker to be their starting catcher for the 1884 season so he transformed also culturally politically because of that this is a young black man who was born at the time slavery still existed, whose parents had been born into slavery, and is now, is now the very first black player to be signed and opening to play on a major league team in the 1884 season. This is like the feel-good story of the year, right? Newspapers were flocking to see this guy play and to report this story. There's always someone who sees a feel-good story and feels bad about it, though, right? There's always someone. And in this case, it happened to be someone with an oversized influence on Major League Baseball because the very first black Major League ball player was being met on the other side of the field for this very first game in 1884 by none other than the first bona fide superstar of Major League Baseball. He was the superstar slugging captain first baseman of the Chicago Cubs, who were themselves the marquee team of early baseball. It was only later that they had decades and decades of futility. <laughs> early on, early on, they were amazing. People would travel all night on trains just to see the Cubs play and to see their dashing young captain with his handlebar mustache hit a home run. And incredibly, and to give the man his due, because in a moment I'll take it away, but to give the man his due, Cap Anson, who's in the Hall of Fame, still holds two or three batting records for the Chicago Cubs. Now, you have to acknowledge that's extraordinary because this was the dead ball era, as they say. As I mentioned, the ball didn't go as far. He still was a monstrous home run hitter. So that's, part, that's definitely part of his record, no matter what. Also part of his record, and not on his plaque in Cooperstown, he was known as an unrepentant racist, he was a bully, and apparently he had an uncommonly foul mouth, which has always fascinated me because, listen, I grew up uh, with brothers, I played sports, I know my way around a locker room, and yet it was said that he had such a foul mouth that even his teammates were embarrassed. I would have loved to have heard what kind of mouth that was, but, but at any rate, not on his plaque in Cooperstown, and Cap Anson did not like the idea that his Chicago Cubs, the vaunted Cubs, were opening up the season against the team that was fielding a black ball player. And the reason I'm using air quotes like that is that he never used that term or any other acceptable term except the unacceptable one that begins with the letter N. That's all he ever used, and he didn't like it so much he played the game under protest and immediately after the game filed a grievance with Major League Baseball threatening that the Cubs would no longer take the field against any team that fielded a black ball player. So you can imagine that the owners of Major League Baseball had to take a threat like this pretty seriously because this is the most famous player in the game, this is the best team in the game, and this guy's saying that this team, this player won't play if we continue to field black ball players. So obviously they had to do something about it and they did. And they met in the summer of 1887 in Buffalo, New York, and they folded to his <laughs> cool Papa Bell, who all baseball historians today generally recognize as almost certainly the fastest human being to have ever played baseball. So it looks like the sky will be the limit for the growth of the Negro Leagues. And it might have been if instead, at the end of the first decade of their existence, the sky fell in. So I think that we often forget how we talk about, I'm not saying the Great Depression, we, we misunderstand that the same way, say, the beginnings of baseball, but I do think as time goes on, we begin to lose sight of just how apocalyptic the Great Depression really was. I'm sure all of us have, you know, relatives, friends, parents, grandparents who 
uh, lived through the Great Depression. My own late dad was uh, 10 or 11 years old in the first years of the Great Depression, 1930, 31, 32. Um, you know, look at the numbers. It's, it's staggering when you look at it now, you know. Unemployment rate in 1933, you know, uh, 25%. A quarter of all Americans out of work. And unbelievably, if you look at minority communities in places like Atlanta, Detroit, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, flip that completely. Three quarters of the minority communities in America were out of work. More than 30,000 businesses going belly up during the worst years of the Great Depression, including the Negro Leagues, with one exception, as we'll see. Now, you might wonder, how many major league teams went out of business? I mean, each of the then 16 major league teams was in and of itself, right, a thriving American business, 30,000 of which are going out of business. So how many major league teams went under? So the reason, the reason, um, and I don't mean to pick on Tom Yawkey, although if encouraged, I will. Um, <laughs> however, there's a reason why I put Tom Yawkey up here, and I'll tell you in a second. The, 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 the major league teams did not go out. No, no major league team folded because, unlike the Negro Leagues, who depended on slender lines of... Look, each of those 14 major, Negro League teams were started by a black businessman. But the level of wealth with those black businessmen and people like Tom Yawkey was night and day, right? So they simply didn't have the deep pockets to withstand the effects of the Great Depression. But the then 16 owners of Major League Baseball did have the deep pockets. These were fabulously wealthy men. And the reason why I put Tom Yawkey up here, because he was not one of them. Now, I don't know if you remember what you got for your 16th birthday, but Tom Yawkey came into 16.34 million. Five years later, he got the rest of his trust and another 16.34 million, and he bought the Boston Red Sox. Tom Yawkey, nonetheless, was the pauper of Major League Baseball owners. So that should give you a sense of the money that these men had and were able to take nothing away from them. Many of them were incredible success stories who in many cases, in many cases like Phil Wrigley, came up from nothing. So more power to them. But they were able to withstand the worst effects of the Great Depression. We mentioned the Cubs. Cubs were owned by Phil Wrigley. I guarantee everyone in this room has used Mr. Wrigley's product at one time or another. Right? If I feel under this table, I might even... <laughs> I did feel... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> St. Louis! St. Louis Cardinals were owned by a guy named Gussie Bush. He was brewing a little beer for himself out there in St. Louis. On the East Coast, the Yankees were owned by Colonel Jake Rupert. He was brewing a little something called Knickerbocker beer. Right? Yawkey was the poorest of the bunch. Okay? Now, no tears for Tom Yawkey. Goodness knows. I'm giving you a sense of what the difference in proportion was and why one survives and one doesn't survive. I mentioned that one single Negro League team did not fold. And we are back to our friend, J.L. Wilkinson, who will come up again and again. Fascinating figure. J.L. Wilkinson, owner of the Kansas City Monarchs. He in the natty little suit right there. Way, way ahead of his time. In terms of being somebody who was progressive, he signed a woman to play baseball <laughs> in the 1930s. So he was way ahead of his time. And um, when the Depression hit, he told his team, listen, if you are willing to suck it up and play baseball every day, I will try to keep you on payroll. And he did. And there they are barnstorming through Canada in 1933. Now, this was very... It was wonderful of him. I mean, it's an incredible thing that he did. He never could have kept that going indefinitely. And fortunately for him and for history, he didn't have to because in the first worst years of the Great Depression, the most improbable event in this whole story takes place. The Negro Leagues come back to life. The Negro Leagues come back to life. And it's improbable on so many levels. First of all, it's improbable where this happens. They come back to life in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is ground zero for American unemployment during the, the Great Depression. So it's in Pittsburgh that come back to life. That's crazy enough. Um, it's also the people who brought them back to life. The two men who brought them back to life were arch enemies. They were arch enemies. They couldn't have been more different. Yes, they were both in Pittsburgh. Yes, they liked sports. One of them liked the big cigar, but that was it. They hated each other's guts. 
In fact, as far as we know, the only time these two men. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I get the sense that you all know who you're here to see. But before I introduce our very special guest speaker, I want to introduce over there Debbie Higgins, who is here from Cornerstone Caregiving. Um, home care, you may recognize her. She has done some sponsorships in the past, but she very kindly um, provided all the refreshments today. So thank you, Debbie. Um, now going to introduce uh, Ted Reinstein. Briefly introduce. I'll be brief, brief, brief. <laughs> all right, yeah. I know he's really got, done a whole lot more than just Chronicle, but... Um, As I always say, Debbie, why put the audience to sleep before I All right, all right, then I won't. <laughs> then I won't. Okay, all right. So I think you all know him um, from Chronicle. He has won awards, and he's written books, and today he's going to talk about his novel, Before Brooklyn. Short and sweet. Thank you, Ted. <laughs> Not everybody can do that. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you very much. That's the kind of intro I like. Quick. Quick. How are you? Good to see you. What a great turnout. I love it. I love it. Thank you all for coming out. Um, so, as Debbie mentioned, I'm going to talk to you uh, this afternoon about my uh, most recent book. And um, how many of you like baseball? How many of you are just so-so about baseball? You'll still like this. You know why? How many, of you, how many of you like history? How many of you like the story of an underdog coming back and beating someone much bigger and stronger? Yeah. That's what this is. Now, how many from Brooklyn? Where in Brooklyn are you from? No kidding. I lived for several years in the Heights. How about that? Just like Patty Duke. Remember her? I'm aging myself. But in this room, that's okay. But the story is not just about baseball. That's my point. It is really about American history. It is about one of America's most iconic legendary heroes, right, Jackie Robinson, who is a lifelong hero of mine. Um, and it is about underdogs. And I, I think we all love the story of an underdog, whether it's somebody beating City Hall or somebody beating baseball, right? It's the still the story of somebody who's motivated by doing something right that may still be really, really difficult to engage victorious in, and you try anyway. In this case, they did it. They did it. And the amazing thing is, the they in this case is not Jackie Robinson. He comes at the end. It's all the people who came before him who are unknown, who are still unknown. Some of you will hear their names for the very first time. And they, I didn't know that. In fact, I'm going to start with a little riddle, OK? Because part of why I wanted to write this book is that I've often been fascinated. A lot of people, everybody, almost everybody said they like history. I've always been fascinated by the fact that very often we think we understand what happened in some certain historical event or era or achievement, right? And then we get older, maybe we read something, someone tells us something, we're like, I didn't know that. And it adds this whole context to something we thought we understood, right? This is a perfect case in point. And I'm going to prove to you right now just how dramatically we sometimes think we know something, and in fact, we have more to learn. All of us. It started with me in writing this book, right? So here's a question to start off. After Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, anybody have a guess as to who became the second black major league ball player? Yes, sir. Larry Doby. Very good guess. Very good guess. Say again. Willie Mays. Willie Mays, another good guess. Two guys right around that scene. Um, first of all, baseball at that time didn't play 162 games. They only played 154. They almost went undefeated. That does not happen in baseball. It simply doesn't happen. Let me bring it up to the present day. There are, I have to remember what year this is because this, the figure, the stat that I'm thinking of was in 2021. So there was three years ago, three years ago, maybe two, um, two Major League Baseball teams, including one that plays less than an hour from here, there were two Major League Baseball teams that cumulatively did not win 143 games in a season, okay? They won 143 games. Now, his arch enemy, Gus Greenlee, promptly tried to outdo him, and he almost did. 
Completely different story with Gus Greenlee. Hard scrabble youth, one of six brothers, gets into fights, gets thrown out of school, goes over, enlists in World War I, goes over and fights. He's wounded at the Battle of Verdun in France. He's decorated, he comes back. Now he needs a job. It's not only the Great Depression, now it's prohibition, so you can't even get a drink to drown your sorrows. <laughs> Put some money together, buys a rickety old car, he's gonna drive a cab. Right? One man cab company. Gets approached a little while later. Guy comes up to him. He says, hey, pal, is this your car? He says, yeah, what about it? He said, no, I just want to know if you want to make some extra money. He says, doing what? He says, well, uh, we, uh, we own some of the speakeasies in Pittsburgh. We're looking for somebody to run our bootleg hooch around to the speakeasies. <laughs> he says, sure, what do you got? Within a week, he's making $100 a day. Now the guy comes up to him. <laughs> I don't know, he must have been the only cab driver. <laughs> in the city of Pittsburgh. Another guy comes up to him. He says, pal, is this your car? He says, what do you got? He says, no, listen, I uh, just want to know if you want to run the bets around for us. Uh, I represent some of the biggest bookies in Pittsburgh, you know, the fights, the basketball games, the football games. He says, uh, yeah, sure, I'm in. So now he's making money hand over fist, and he realizes that if he just cut out the middlemen, I know how to do this, he thought. I can, I can keep all the money. I don't mean that he like, cut them out, but... He did go into business doing this all by himself. And at one point, in the worst years of the Great Depression, Gus Green he was making $12,500 a week. <laughs> so you can imagine, uh, he didn't know quite what to know, do with all that money. Um, he built himself a ball field, even though he didn't own a baseball team, but he had hoped to acquire one, if only to get back at his arch enemy. Um, he bought a jazz club. He created an incredible jazz club, which if you want to have some fun sometime, Google the Crawford Grill in Pittsburgh because he built this jazz club, which became kind of a melting pot. Everybody was welcome at the Crawford Grill and every jazz great in America. Billy Holiday, Ella, Dizzy Gillespie, Louis Armstrong, they all played the Crawford Grill. And then his chance came to buy a baseball team. So he did. Now, I don't know how much he liked baseball. I don't know how much he liked jazz. What he really liked was that these things were allowing him to launder all this dirty money. So he bought the team. He renamed them to cross promote his jazz club. And the Pittsburgh Crawfords were born, one of the other three most iconic Negro League teams. And a year after his arch enemy wins 143 games, Gus Greenlee's Pittsburgh Crawfords win almost 100 games. And he did that the same way he did most everything else in his adult life. He stole it. Uh, <laughs> No, when I say, when I say he stole it, I should, I should, I should, I should, I don't mean so much that he stole it. He poached it uh, because he poached the two best players from his, his arch enemy's team. And yes, two players by themselves were all it took to win 100 games because they were not just the two best players on the home, on the, on the home state grades. They are two of the best players who have ever played the sport of baseball. Both are in the Hall of Fame. One was a promising, lanky young pitcher named of Satchel Paige. The other was a slugging young catcher named of Josh Gibson. So you can understand if those are the only two players you poach, you're all set. You got the pitcher and the catcher. Nobody's going to hit the ball anyway. It doesn't matter who else is in the field. So, so that's, pretty much, that's pretty much what happened. And there is no overstating. This book is about underdogs. But I would say that Paige and Gibson are the only two sung heroes in the book. There's nothing unsung about Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson. They are two of the greatest baseball players who have ever lived, white, black, polka dot, doesn't matter. Uh, Satchel Paige is bigger than life. Satchel Paige, do you know that Satchel Paige is one of the five most quoted Americans in history? Yes, I know, Jefferson, Washington, Lincoln, Roosevelt had some great things to say. <laughs> Never as funny as Satchel Paige, right? So Satchel Paige was bigger than life, would be on my list of the five greatest pitchers who've ever lived. Josh Gibson, by contrast, was very quiet, very shy, very good friends, teammates, sometimes roommate with Paige, um, very shy, very quiet, tragic life, often said, I just let my bat do the talking. Um, he was known, even in his playing days, in terms of how good he was, he was known, even in his playing days, as the Black Babe Ruth. So that tells you something. May have hit the longest home run ever hit at Yankee Stadium. My favorite funny story from my entire research. So late in his playing days, Josh Gibson met the real life Babe Ruth. 
They met at some function. And Babe Ruth, as the story goes, put his big meaty arm around Josh Gibson, I guess like he liked to do, and he shook him a little bit, and he said, Mr. Gibson, what a goddamn honor. He said, hey, I understand they call you the Black Babe Ruth. What do you think of that? And Josh Gibson, in his shy little squeaky voice, <laughs> looked, looked up at Babe Ruth, and he said, well, Mr. Ruth, I got to tell you, my people call you the white Josh Gibson. <laughs> what do you think of that big guy? So, so, <laughs> question. We have spent the first part of this whole talk, the last 20 minutes, talking about the Negro Leagues, which is as it should be because they are the absolutely most important unsung hero in the whole book. So that's as it should be. However, how do we know so much about the Negro Leagues? I've just been telling you, including that anecdote just now, from books that I've read about the Negro Leagues. You can read great stories and stats and players' profiles from the Negro Leagues. How? How? Negro Leagues didn't keep any records. Negro Leagues didn't uh, themselves have statisticians, never kept any records. No white mainstream newspaper ever followed the Negro Leagues. Um, the Negro Leagues were a hand-to-mouth operation. Every single game, they were concerned with whether or not they had enough players, whether they had enough bats and balls, whether or not they had enough cleats, whether or not they had enough gas for the bus, and whether the bus would get to the game. They're not employing statisticians. Major League Baseball in New York City has three and a half floors devoted to stats, right? You can go home right now. You can Google the first major league game ever played, and you can find out who did what in the second inning. You can't do that with the Negro Leagues. So wait a minute. So if the Negro Leagues didn't keep track of their records, if the white mainstream press never at any time in the history of the Negro Leagues ever devoted a single beat reporter to any Negro League team or the Negro Leagues as a whole, how would we know so much about the Negro Leagues? the second most important unsung hero in the entire story, the black press. The black press was keeping track of the Negro Leagues. We forget. We forget the black press. And, and, and part of that is good. Part of that is good. Part of the, the fact that we forget about the black press today is a sign of progress, right? Because today, today, whoever you are, white, black, brown, Asian, it doesn't matter. You read any newspaper, and there may be some news you need to read or want to read about people who look like you. But that wasn't the case then. If you were a black person in Pittsburgh in 1930, 1920, 1940 for that matter, you weren't going to read in the mainstream white press something that was of concern to you and the black community. wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to be there. Nobody was reporting on it in the white mainstream newspapers. That was the role, the critical role, of the black press. And pioneering newspaper publishers, speaking of Pittsburgh, like Robert Lee Van of the Pittsburgh Courier, greatest distribution of any black newspaper in history, just slightly more so than Robert Sengstack Abbott's equally legendary Chicago Defender. And they hired great pioneering sports writers like Wendell Smith and Sam Lacey, who were given, they were given a mission by their editors, which is something the journalists today would be like, well, wait a minute. So, so in journalism today, whether it's broadcast journalism or print, there's generally what's called a firewall between the editorial side and the repertorial side, right? So if you're going out to, to do a story and you're trying to get some different angles on a story, you're not to have any consultation with people on the editorial side who have an opinion about it, right? But these publishers understood something crucial, that if you're going to have pioneering sports writers covering great Negro League teams that are players like Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson are doing amazing things on, then their mission was also to remind people that when Wendell Lacey, when you report on a game in Yankee Stadium in 1939, when Satchel Paige pitched for the Black Yankees, against the New York Yankees and struck out Joe DiMaggio, the great Joe DiMaggio, three times, only time in his career he ever struck out three times. He was told, you remind people, you remind people in your column. I don't care what the hell you put in the box score, but you remind people. There will be people tomorrow morning who look at this game and say, why can't we get somebody like Satchel Paige and Pinstripes? You remind them why they can't. And they did, and they did. Now. Next question comes up. 
Because when, when DiMaggio struck out three times against Satchel Paige in 1939, people were reading about that and were saying, who is this Satchel Paige? They were reading about that in Walpole. They were reading about that in Boston. They were reading about that in Bangor. They were reading about it in Breckenridge, Colorado, in Portland, Maine, Portland, Oregon, Phoenix, Fort Worth. You get the idea. All over the country. How? These black newspapers were just like the Negro League teams themselves. They were hand-to-mouth operations. It was all these small newspapers could do to get out the paper five nights a week and hit just a dozen or so box stands just in the black community. Not citywide, right? And it was still hand-to-mouth. How were they getting their newspapers distributed all over the country? The Boston Globe wasn't in 1930. How? How? My favorite and the most completely improbable ally and underdog in the whole story, the Pullman Porters. You know, I knew something, like just because I was a lifelong baseball fan, but I knew something about some of these unsung heroes we've talked about. I certainly knew about Satchel Paige and, and, and Josh Gibson, and you know, I came to find out about people like you know, Cumberland Posey and so forth. I did not know anything about the role that the Pullman Porters played. And you might well be saying, as I did, what the hell do the Pullman Porters have to do with breaking the color barrier? They're working on the trains. The Pullman Porters, in the golden age of rail travel, right? Overnight rail travel in the uh, teens and 20s, 30s, 40s, even into the 50s, they were the face of overnight train travel. They were the person you would interact with, right? You didn't interact with the white engineer. The conductors were always white, but you only interacted with them to punch your ticket. The person you actually had contact with were the Pullman porters. They would meet you at the platform. They'd show you to your seats. Later, they might show you to your dining table. Later, they might show you back to your berths and where they would have turned down the covers. This guy here is keeping track of who needs a wake-up call when. Of course, at that time, it would have been a wake-up knock. But the point is, what do they have to do with breaking the color barrier? Ah. So... Those pioneering newspaper publishers were very, very creative men. And at that time, they were all men. And they were super creative and ingenious. Because, you know, if you own a newspaper, if you own a website today, right, it's all about eyeballs. It's all about eyeballs. It just just depends how many people come on your site for how long. You get somebody on some sites, if you get somebody on for 10 seconds, boom, you've done what you need to do to interest advertisers and paying for your site. Newspapers you got to sell the newspaper. Physical. You had to sell the newspaper. That's how, the only way you can up your circulation. But they had no chance of selling newspapers all around the country. But in the Pullman Porters, they saw a potential extraordinary ally. These, unlike any black people at that, white people, any people during the Great Depression, are traveling all around the country every day. And they know... These publishers knew there is a thirst for information, especially about some of the bigger black communities like Pittsburgh and Chicago throughout the country. And they said, if we can just interest some of the porters in surreptitiously dropping off our newspapers, we could get our papers all over the country. And they did. They didn't need every porter on every train. They just needed one or two on a one run once or twice a week. And they got that. Now you're wondering, how did that work? So let's say a train is leaving... South Station, Boston. It's going to make a run down the eastern seaboard all the way to Miami, right? So the porters were also in charge of provisioning the kitchen, the food, right? So they might have a deal in Boston with, say, a black bakery in Forest Hills, Mattapan, Dorchester, Roxbury. The little bread truck would come up to South Station. At that time, you could drive it right out on the platform. Little platform in the back of the truck, maybe four or five, five five-foot-tall wicker baskets filled with bread. Underneath the bread the black newspapers of Boston. Train trakes off, gets to New York. They unload, along with all the other stuff, they unload, black, they, 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 at that time, the, the great black newspaper from New York, the Amsterdam News, and they would do that all the way down the eastern seaboard. So that by 1939, when DiMaggio strikes out three times, and that's being read by people all over America, you have the wonderful anecdote of a visiting New York Times executive who was vacationing in L.A. And he gets up one morning and he decides, I want to go out and get the New York Times that uh, I assume has come in overnight. 
on the, uh, on, on the train. And he hits the first newsstand, and he can't find the Times. But he sees the Pittsburgh Courier. And he says, okay, well, that's probably like a month old. And he says, no, ooh, it was yesterday's paper. He goes on to the next newsstand, no Times. Another Pittsburgh Courier, today's edition. And he calls New York, and he says, what the hell is happening? <laughs> the Pullman Porters, that's what was happening. So 1940, spoiler alert, we are now... We are now less than 10 minutes and five years from the end of our talk. <laughs> and spoiler alert, the color barrier is going to fall. How? How is the color barrier going to fall in five years? In 1940, Major League Baseball was no closer to dropping the color barrier than it had been in 1920, which is when this guy became baseball commissioner. He was the first commissioner of Major League Baseball. Still in charge in 1940, uh, as ornery, stubborn as ever, and that's how his wife described him. Um, <laughs> but he won't even entertain it. So what happens? Well, two things happen. Two things happen. One, may he rest in peace, Kennesaw Mountain Landis dies. And the story shifts to New York. It shifts to New York for two reasons. One, another sports writer, but two, the 1930s ends with another worldwide apocalypse, just like the Depression, which of course is what? World War II. And in New York, this guy, this guy, Lester Rodney, is working his first job as a sports writer. Now, he would have worked for anybody. He was, he was young, he was hungry to write about baseball, and he would have worked for anybody. But as it happens, in the late 1930s, the American Communist Party's daily newspaper, The Daily Worker, is starting a sports section. And they need an editor. And he got the job, which creates one of the greatest trivia questions of all time. Because <laughs> Lester Rodney is the only person in American history who carried in his wallet both a membership card for the American baseball writers and the American Communist Party. So <laughs> it was like, it's a great trivia question. Use it sometime. Right. So Lester Rodney is writing about baseball, and he realizes something about the way things are headed. And mind you, this is the late 1930s. America doesn't get into the war until 1941 in Pearl. And there were plenty of people, plenty of people, some with famous names, that did not want to get involved with what was happening. And yet Lester Rodney started to say in his column, we are going to war. You mind the word here, we are going to war. Blacks as well as whites will be training to fight and will be asked to die if necessary to defend their country. But those who are black and who have played baseball will return to a country where they are still second class citizens, having been asked to die for their country, but not allowed to play baseball there. So that is the argument. That's it. If you ever wonder what brought the color barrier down, that's it. That's what's going to bring the color barrier down because it just appears for people to be too much. It happens. It happens. Other people picked up on Lester Rodney's, what he was saying. For instance, this was a handkerchief that was given out in all editions of the Pittsburgh Courier to support what they dubbed the double V campaign, double victory, because it was agonizing. It was agonizing for a lot of young black men and women to look at whether or not they wanted to go and fight and maybe die for a country that still regarded them as a second class citizen. And the double V campaign was about giving a rationalization for that argument. Yes, fight. Double victory, fight. Go fight, defeat Adolf Hitler, victory won, come home, defeat Jim Crow, victory two. And that handkerchief was worn in the bomber jacket sleeves of all members of the Tuskegee Airmen, the most celebrated all-black unit in World War II. But it is another all-black unit in World War II that I bet you've never heard of that will take us to the end of our story in the next few minutes. The 761st Tank Battalion was the first all-black armored unit in American history. And what connects it with our story is that one of the officers of the 761st was a young lieutenant name of Jack Roosevelt Robinson.
Jackie Robinson got his lieutenant stripes at Fort Kearney in Kansas in 1940. He was transferred to Fort Hood in Texas to help take command of the fight in 761st, and he could not wait to lead the 761st into combat against the Nazis. Didn't get there. The 761st did, without its young lieutenant. Just before the 761st shipped out, Jackie Robinson flunked his final physical. An old knee injury reared its head. He had been an all-American halfback at UCLA, not clear for combat. He desperately asked for permission to accompany the 761st as a special morale officer, request denied. He was crushed, said it was the most crushing disappointment of his life. 761st shipped out. Jackie Robinson decided to check out of the hospital. He was going to go back to the base at Fort Hood, get a drink at the Black Officers Club, drown his sorrows. Jumps on a bus, get to Fort Hood. Fort Hood is still today. One of the three biggest military bases in the world. Enormous buses constantly circling the base. He jumps on a bus, takes a seat right behind the driver, front row. You might guess where this is going. It's going there. So at that time, it didn't matter whether you were an officer, which he was. It didn't matter whether you were a black serviceman who had returned in country after having lost a limb. You were still expected to get up and move to the back of the bus when it began to fill up with white passengers. Uh, Jackie Robinson knew something, however, that night. He wasn't just looking for trouble. He knew something that the driver probably didn't know, later testified he didn't know, doesn't matter. But Jackie Robinson knew that 48 hours earlier, President Roosevelt had signed an executive order forbidding segregation within American military bases transportation. So he knew he could sit where he wanted to sit. Driver didn't know, didn't care, doesn't matter. Stops at a sentry post when Robinson refuses to move his seat. Two MPs get on the bus. They handcuff Jackie Robinson, arrested, court-martialed, insubordination. How many of you know that Jackie Robinson was once court-martialed? No, no one knows. Because I always say there's a very odd thing about that. If you knew that Jackie Robinson was court-martialed, then someone would say to you, who the hell's Jackie Robinson? Because he never would have broken the color barrier because Branch Rickey could have never signed him if he'd been dishonorably discharged from the army. But he beat the court-martial. So he beat the court-martial. Now it's 1944. He needs a job. He, he honorably is discharged from the army. He needs a job. Somebody tells him, you should get in touch with our friend rears his head again, J.L. Wilkinson of the Kansas City Monarchs. Remember, I said 25 years out. We're 25 years out now. He said, why don't you get in touch with him? I think he's looking for some players. Some of his best players are still in theater in Europe. So he does. And he writes J.L. Wilkinson. He says, Mr. Wilkinson, I'm wondering if I can have a tryout with the Monarchs. I played baseball before. And J.L. Wilkinson doesn't write back. He calls. Picks up the phone. I would have loved to have been on this call. I, if you've read, you read Jackie Robinson's autobiography, he talks about it. But So he calls him. Jackie Robinson answers the phone. He says, hello? This is Jackie Robinson. There's a pause, and Joe Wilkinson says, I know who you are, I just dialed the phone. <laughs> and it goes downhill from there. He says, he says, so I understand you're interested in trying out for my monarchs. He says, yes, sir. He says, well, you can't have a tryout. There's a pause, according to Jackie Robinson, it lasted three and a half minutes, but at any point, there was a pause. And Joe Wilkinson says, would you like to know why you can't try out? I says, yes, sir. Because I'm giving you a job instead. How's that? So he came to Houston to spring training with the Monarchs, and he was all set to try out and start the season with the Monarchs. Meanwhile, how many of you know, now nobody knew that Jackie Robinson and court Marshall, anybody know that less than three weeks after this picture was taken in Kansas City, Jackie Robinson wouldn't be in Kansas City. He'd be in Boston, less than 60 minutes away from where we are right now, trying out for the Boston Red Sox. Because at the same time he's starting the season in Kansas City, in Boston, this guy, Izzy Muchnick, is intent on creating a tryout for black ball players by the Boston Red Sox. Now, he doesn't know Jackie Robinson. He just knows that he's been influenced by that same Lester Rodney philosophy. And he's wondering what I can do. I'm not a sports writer, but I am a lawyer. I am a city councilor. 
He was the second Jew Jewish city councilor. He became the first Jewish chairman of the Boston School Committee. He was trying to think of a way that he could pressure the Red Sox to hold a tryout for some black ball players. Now, he's a lawyer, so he understands it ain't going to be enough to just ask nicely. He needs some leverage. He needs some juice. And he found it. He found it in one of those old, now gone, blue laws. Remember them? Well, in 1945, there was still an existing blue law that prohibited baseball from being played in Boston on a Sunday without the unanimous consent of the Boston City Council. I always imagine that when Izzy Muchnick found that in the Boston bylaws, he must have just taken his glasses off, rubbed his eyes, and thought, this is leverage. I'm a city councilor. All I got to do is threaten to withhold my vote. And he did. He did. He wrote the brain trust of the Boston Red Sox. There they are. There's Yawkey. There's player manager Joe Cronin. There is general manager Eddie Collins, himself a former Hall of Famer. And he wrote to them and he said, Mr. Collins, I am asking, in light of the fact that there are now many returning professional black ball players having just served their country, looking for a tryout with some major league teams, and I'm wondering if the Red Sox would be willing to do that. And Eddie Collins wrote back and he said he was a very charming Southern guy and he said, my dear counselor, he said, it may interest you to know that in my entire tenure with the Boston Red Sox, we have never had we have never had a Negro, as he put it, a Negro person come to us and ask for employment. I can only conclude there's no interest. Yours cordially, Eddie Collins. So Izzy Muchnick knew when he was getting a load of you know what. So he waited a little bit. And he waited some more. And he waited until it was exactly one week before that vote on Sunday baseball in the Boston City Council. And he sent a cablegram back to Eddie Collins quicker. And he said, Mr. Collins, it appears you have no interest in entertaining my sincere request, and therefore this cable should serve to inform you when the vote is taken on Sunday baseball in the city council chamber Wednesday next, I will be withholding my vote. I don't know what the exact time duration was between the time that Eddie Collins opened that cable and appeared in his boss, Tom Yawkey's office. I have a very strong sense it was well under three minutes and he was running because that would have been a cataclysm financially. 1945, pre-TV, baseball makes all of its revenue from ticket sales, and on Sundays in 1945, every single Major League team plays two games. The Red Sox would have been denied 50% of their Sunday revenue. Unthinkable. So they send the cable back, and they say, fine, literally, fine. You can have your tryout. Three players, that's it, three. No press, or the deal's off. Have them at Gate D, Fenway Park, 11 a.m., Monday morning, April 12th. Cordially yours, Eddie Collins. Now, Izzy Muchnick knew a lot about Boston's bylaws, didn't know a lot about black baseball. So he consulted our friend Wendell Smith of the Pittsburgh Courier, and he asked him if he could personally hand-select three qualified players for a tryout with the Red Sox. This is big. Has never happened. Has never happened. So he does. And they are picked, and one of them includes the young strapping shortstop of the Kansas City Monarchs who comes to Boston with his two compatriots. They check into a hotel and they're all set to try out on Monday morning, April 12th, when unfortunately history intervenes. On Monday, April 12th, 1945, Franklin Delano Roosevelt dies and America shuts down. Now, 24 hours later, America begins to come back to life. 48 hours later, America is pretty much fully back to life, except at the executive offices of Fenway Park, where they appear to be in the throes of inconsolable grief, which is odd because all three of those men were registered Republicans. But the thing is, <laughs> but the thing is, but the thing is, they weren't in grief. They weren't in grief. They were trying to run out the clock. They were trying to run out the clock, and they almost made it one more day. All they need was one more day, and they're out of their city. Because on the afternoon of April 16th, 1945, they're catching a train out of Back Bay Station for New York, where they will open up the season in 1945 against the Yankees at the stadium on the 17th. But on the morning of April 16th, the story breaks. A white sports writer, Dave Egan of the old Record American, Dave Egan breaks the story on the front page of the newspaper, and then it's picked up by everybody. And it's kind of a, a, a letter to Boston 
residents, sports fans. He says, dear reader, you're not aware of it, but there are three Negro, as he wrote, there are three Negro ball players who have been promised a tryout with your Boston Red Sox. They have been marooned in a hotel room in the city for a week now, and now the team is trying to run out on their promise. That was it. The Red Sox knew they had to have this damn tryout. So they called up Izzy Muchnick. They said, fine, get the guys over here. They did. They trooped over to Fenway Park. They suited up. They took the field. They ran the bases, took some infield, took some batting practice. Less than 50 minutes later, they're called off the field. Joe Cronin thanks them very much. They're told that the Red Sox will be in touch. None of them ever heard from the Red Sox the rest of their natural lives. But you know who was paying rapt attention and apparently going out of his mind? Branch Rickey. Branch Rickey in Brooklyn was getting reports that Tom Yawkey, who he loathed, by the way, was about to potentially upset a plan that Ricky had in the works for over a year now and sign Jackie Robinson and send him to some godforsaken place like Louisville. So Ricky had to act, and he did. He did let the season play out because he understood Yaki well enough to know he wasn't going to do this right away, and indeed he didn't. It took Tom Yaki another 14 years to sign a black ball player, dead last. But Ricky didn't know that. We didn't know that. So as soon as the Negro League season ended in September 1945, Jackie Robinson was whisked to the executive offices of the Brooklyn Dodgers on Montague Street in Brooklyn Heights right there. He was signed to a contract for the Dodgers' top minor league team, the Montreal Royals. And of course, the rest is history. Wearing number 42 as he trooped out onto the field at Ebbets to his position at first base amid the din of cheering fans, of broadcasters announcing history, and of exploding flashbulbs capturing it, I believe that there were two inaudible sounds at Ebbets Field that day. The sound of a wall falling and of a cheering that could not be heard with the ear, only with the heart. It rose from those not present physically, but spiritually. Those who could not be seen, but were very much there. Just the same. Moses Fleetwood Walker didn't live to see it. And by the time he died, broken, bitter, alcoholic, buried in debt, he couldn't even imagine it. But he was there. Bud Fowler. Bud Fowler, a man who seemed to play baseball every day and travel anywhere it took to play baseball, was now in Brooklyn. The Pullman Porters, some of whom that very morning were on the rails themselves, traveling west, north, east, south, Rolling along the rails within a mile of Ebbets Field, they were there. The black sports writers, the Negro Leaguers, the Negro Leaguers past and present, those who had come too early and those who were young enough to imagine that they too might walk through the wall, they were there. And the African-American veterans of the war just ended and those indeed who died were there. On this momentous day, a ball game was played before a crowd, both present and cheering, and another crowd silent and unseen. They watched the game, and they watched the terrible wrong being finally righted. To be sure, even as a black ball player bonded onto an otherwise all-white field, racism was still alive and well in Brooklyn and clear on across America. So many other barriers remain still in place. Many still are. But on this day, on this day, some of the hurt and the humiliation was solved. On this day, hope and faith that had long seemed to have run out seemed to be magically redeemed. On this day, the long arc of the moral universe seemed to bend improbably toward Brooklyn, touching down on the dirt and the grass of a creaky old ballpark where the familiar white lines would no longer bar a black ball player. And in the bottom of the seventh inning, right there, when Jackie Robinson laid down a perfect bunt and raced toward first base, they were right there alongside willing him on. And as he sprinted on to second base and caught his breath, they exhaled with him. After all, it had been more than a 60-year journey, and they helped him get there. The next Dodger batter doubled. Jackie Robinson rounded third, and he was home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I know that all of you have, you know, other things to get to in your lives, but um, 
it, we can take a couple of minutes. If anybody has a quick question or two, uh, I'm happy to order. Yes, sir. Did Boston have a Negro League team? No. Boston never had a Negro League team. There were some professional black teams that played not only in the city, but in and around the city. Worcester had a, a terrific black team. There was a team called the Lynn Live Oaks that played at Fraser Field in Lynn. Uh, that was a black professional team, but they never had a Negro League team. There was also a great team that played out in Nashua, New Hampshire. Yeah. Did you really? I didn't play, but I, I, I worked on the ground crew. I watched the right field foul ball. Really? I, I, I had a chance to talk to the players. What I did yeah. hear, by the way, yeah. is that Mike Higgins was a mean, uh, really bad guy. But Tom Yawkey always yeah. seemed like a decent guy. Yes. So who, I mean, why did this happen? Right. That's a good question. I'm Speaking of Tom Yawkey. Yeah, so you mentioned Mike Higgins. I always joked that Mike Higgins, who at one point was the manager of the Red Sox in the 1950s, I always joked that Mike Higgins was an equal opportunity bigot. Because he was, no, because he was not only a vicious racist, he was a total anti-Semite. So he was, a, he was an all opportunity. But Tom Yawkey, let me answer your question. And he had a foul mouth, the best bigots do. So Tom Yawkey, you know, people sometimes ask me, do you think Tom Yawkey was racist? Do you think Tom Yawkey was racist because he didn't sign a black ball player for 14 years? Um, let me give you a short, the short answer. Yes! Listen, listen. Tom Yawkey did wonderful things. People who do bad things have also done some wonderful things. Tom Yawkey, I didn't know. You knew him, I didn't know him. But you know, you have to look at the facts. And the facts are, he waited 14 years to sign a black ball player. Meanwhile, there were teams who signed black ball players who were going to the World Series because of them. So I never want to hear from anybody about, like, you know, well, they had great teams. No. Let me tell you something. They had great teams and what a black ball player would have done. 1948, you may recall, 1948, the Red Sox lose a one-game playoff against the Cleveland Indians for the American League pennant, which is a double shame because not only did it prevent them from going to the World Series, it would have been the only time in Boston's history there would have been a Subway Series because the Braves won the National League pennant. So you would have been able to walk six blocks from Braves Field to Fenway Park for the World Series. The reason why the Red Sox lost is because they weren't the better team, quite simply. But do you know who could have been playing on, on, the, on the Boston Red Sox in 1948? A, Jackie Robinson, and B, Willie Mays. Do you think they might have won that playoff game? I rest my case. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyway, yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you realize that Joe Morgan was right down the Joe Morgan! Walpole's Joe Morgan, of course! Snowplow Joe! <laughs> Joe Morgan, Morgan Magic! I forgot that Joe Morgan, Walpole, absolutely! Absolutely. Yeah, did you know him? You must have known him. Yeah. Great guy. He seen, I never met Joe, but I always had the impression Joe Morgan was one of those rare people. It seemed like n probably none of that changed him at all, right? He probably came back to the neighborhood and was yeah. like, hey, yeah. I, right? I forgot that. Yeah. You know what's funny about, I say, Walpole's Joe Morgan. So uh, you ever see this, that, this phenomenon? I love it. So all the players from Massachusetts and maybe it's the same in other states, that have played on major league teams, everybody puts the time, it's like this part of their name. It's like Walpole's Joe Moore, what is Walpole's first name? But it's, no, but it's everybody. Uh, uh, Burlington's uh, Joe, uh, who was the Braves pitcher? Joe, um, oh my God. There was a time I remembered these things. But um, you know what I'm saying, right? Uh, Tewksbury's, uh, I can't remember his name either. I'm, I, just, I just walked myself out on a limb and, and it fell off. You seen your moment, yes. But anyway, you get the idea. I uh, thank you for bringing that up. Walpole's Joe Morgan, fantastic. Anyone else? Yes, in the back, sir. What were the uh, what, what the Braves putting any pressure on the Red Sox by signing black ball players? And, and not enough pressure. <laughs> I mean, not enough pressure. Yes, they signed before the Red. The Braves signed in 1954. Uh, what was his name? Oh my God, I'm stopping while in my head. <laughs> I'm going to test myself as soon as I get in the car and see if I can remember my kids' names. Yes? Oh, Satchel Page, sure. Of course, nothing, nothing wrong with Warren Spahn either. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, Paige, is, I, 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 I would have given anything to have, you know, met Satchel Paige. Uh, yeah, what a, what, a, what a legend, what a legend. Anyone else? So listen, I want to thank you all very much for coming out in the middle of your day. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thank Debbie, and I want to thank, I want to thank the Council on Aging for having me today. Uh, I do have some of my books. I have some before Brooklyn and a couple of other titles. If anybody would like a book while I'm packing up here, I'm happy to sign a book for you. You'll have to buy it first. But, um, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Maybe I'll come back with I have another book coming out next summer. And I'd love to come back if you want me to come back. All right.